Good morning. And welcome to Clean Lakes Alliance's Science Cafes. Uh, we'd like to thank you all for coming in person and for those who are joining us virtually from the leisure of their home. Maybe you're in your backyard enjoying this beautiful day. Unfortunately, Max uh, is working his way through traffic through the city of Madison on his way down here. Uh, but today we have a great program uh, that people always have a lot of questions about. Um, just to let you know, Clean Lakes Alliance is not responsible for the uh, aquatic plant harvesting, but we're really excited to share with you uh, what the county, county does to protect our lakes. Uh, today's talk, we'll talk about the process, the plants that are targeted, the challenges, how harvesting makes a difference and make lakes better for all. Uh, if you're watching online, please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get questions at the end of today's talk. But before I do that, I'd like to do uh, some of our sponsors. Uh, First Weber Foundation and Johnson Financial Group are our presenting sponsors. This event is hosted by the Edgewire Hotel. We get a lot of in-kind services from the Edgewire. Thank you to them. Our supporting sponsor, National Guardian Life. We also have two production partners, UW Extension Lakes and University of Wisconsin Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, our media partner, WKOW. And also we have wonderful uh, four sustain sustaining founders, Fully Liner, Lands and Madison Community Foundation and Spectrum. And in the month of May, we added the Edgewire to that uh, because of their long-term sustaining uh, partnership with the Clean Lakes Alliance. Uh, as we sort of go on, I want a big thank you to those people uh, who did Loop the Lake. Uh, it was a great event. We went around Lake Monona, had different stops at parks, really exposing people to the beauty of Lake Monona. And it was a partnership between the City of Madison Parks Department, the Clean Lakes Alliance, and Monona Parks Department. Sort of moving forward, um, it raised $74,000 this year to help us do educational programs, uh, put grants in the communities, but also your support matters. And we really appreciate your lake partnership through your business, your friendship through your individual donation. And those things go out to help us do our educational programs. Uh, we do grants every year. We have $100,000 in grants that are going out the door to other organizations to help uh, protect our lakes. You can join now online or on your phone. It starts as little as $35 or also you can give monthly uh, at different levels. Um, sort of a reminder coming up, we have a join us at our friends event coming up on July 19th at Buck and Honey's on your high river in Monona from 4.30 to 6.30. Just prior to that, we're gonna be having our community board meeting. So many of our board members will be there. You can talk to them, ask questions. There are people from friends of, uh, Lake Higanza will be there, people from the county, the city, other friends groups. So it'll be a great way for you to connect with other people and other organizations who have passion for the lakes. Uh, sort of going forward with that, um, there'll be appetizers and cocktails and all things great at Buck and Honey's. Um, but today I'd like to welcome Paul Thiessen from National Guardian Life. Uh, he has participated in many different Clean Lake Finance programs and he's going to talk to us a little bit about today. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, as James said, NGL is proud to be a supporting sponsor of these talks, along with a variety of other Clean Lakes Alliance events, uh, whether that be volunteering opportunities, fundraising, community events like Lake the Loop. We had a couple dozen people out there or uh, my personal favorite, the educational events like this. Um, it's important to be well-informed and I'm uh, really excited to learn more about our watershed today. Today's talk is titled Aquatic Plant Management on the Ahara Lakes. Here to present on this topic is Pete Jaffke. Over the course of his 31 year career, Pete has worked at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and for the last 26 years, he's been at the Dane County Land and Water Resource Department. 
In addition to working with aquatic plants, he also serves as Dane County's aquatic species coordinator and assists with all things related to lakes and rivers. Uh, like James said, just another quick reminder, we'll take any questions at the end of this talk from both our in-person and our online audience. So hold questions until then. Uh, please join me in welcoming Pete Jatke. Morning, everybody. And uh, I want to extend uh, uh, my gratitude and thanks to uh, Clean Lakes Alliance for allowing me to, to speak this morning. So I think uh, one thing I want to make clear throughout this presentation, aquatic plants and the management of them on the Ahara chain uh, can be quite challenging for our department uh, for multiple reasons, uh, especially uh, May through August. So. Um, there's also a lot of other work that goes into the program uh, the other months of the year, and we'll share some of that with you today. So uh, APM, Aquatic Plant Management in Dane County. Um, aquatic, uh, the benefits of aquatic plants are great. So I hear all the time that uh, uh, you know, folks call them weeds and they don't like them, but um, aquatic plants are a sign of a healthy lake. So. Um, in addition to supporting a wide range of invertebrates and food and shelter for fish, they improve the water quality, they can take available phosphorus out, protect shorelines with their root structures, and to a certain extent, um, you know, they have some aesthetic value to them as well. Uh, we kind of classify the plants into three categories. So on the bottom of this picture here um, is what we call submerged plants. So those are the plants that you will typically see our harvesters um, harvesting. Uh, our permit does not allow for us to harvest floating leaf plants like your lilies or lotus um, or our emergence, um, like you can see in the background of that upper picture there um, with, with um, uh, the plants that are kind of extended above the, the water line there. So three different types of, uh, of plants um, that we deal with. So I want to talk a little bit about where the plants grow in the lake. So, well, yeah, Pete, right, they grow in the water, um, blah, 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 blah. Actually, what we see is most of our plants grow in 16 feet of water or less. So that's kind of our photic zone that we classify. So when we're out sampling or we're doing any of our work, the majority of our work takes place, obviously, in 16 feet of water or less. So, um, you know, the center of Lake Mendota, Kiganza, Monona, um, plenty of room to recreate out there, uh, avoid uh, some of the floaters and other things. So that's the main area uh, where the majority of our activity takes place. So I want to go back in time a little bit. <clears throat> this here is... Um, from, from the journal of John Allen back in 1832. And I always find it interesting to hear these historical descriptions of water bodies um, wherever they are at, but uh, he was coming through for the Black Hawk War and he, he came across, uh, across Lake Monona, noticed how it was clear as crystal and had these white um, pebbles around it and the terminology of being the least bit swampy. So um, prior to really any, any types of uh, uh, colonization or urbanization uh, that we see about 100 years later, as we move into the early 20s, so roughly about 100 years later, we see the impacts of putting raw sewage in our water bodies and so on and so forth. And uh, this is 1925. Uh, before the uh, spraying of copper sulfate. So chemicals were a big tool early on in the early 1900s through about the mid 1900s on aquatic plant management on the Yahira chain. And it just wasn't um, copper sulfate um, that we used, but it was also oops, arsenic. And I got a kick out of this uh, uh, last uh, little written portion there. And it says, 
eight days after treatment and it killed weeds. Well, can you imagine that arsenic killing weeds? So um, what I can tell you is that uh, there are two, two types of plant control in the state of Wisconsin that DNR monitors. And that is NR107, which is the, the code for chemical treatment, and NR109, which is the code for mechanical removals, which is primarily what we fall under. Um, to my knowledge, since uh, roughly 2011, um, I have not heard of a, of a chemical application being approved on the chain. I'm sure there's been a few that have been applied, but um, I don't have access to that database. But it, it, uh, it has not been. So we hear rumors, John Reimer and myself, we hear rumors all the time that so-and-so is treating here and there, or the railroad snuck in at midnight and treated Monona Bay, but um, we have yet to determine if any of those have actually been true. So our aquatic plant management, um, we're required to have goals and objectives um, when we put our plans together, and there's been some changes over the years. So Typically, we targeted Eurasian water milfoil as one of our priorities. Right now, our priority is flood mitigation, so we want to keep water moving through the system. Kind of course, corresponds with uh, some of the efforts that uh, John is doing with, with the uh, dredging and the suck the muck. And then our second priority would be recreation, navigation, and beach access, uh, followed by shallow cuts and filamentous algae. And, I do want to point out when we talk about filamentous algae, that's the long green stringy stuff you'll typically see. I've seen it, you know, uh, yesterday actually when I was out on Lake Wabisa, but um, those plants will float up to the surface and they're really hard for our machines to gather because it'll fall through the screen. But if it's attached to any plant material, um, it's pretty effective. And then the last, uh, the last point would be special events. So something like, um, uh, the Iron Man coming up in September, and then uh, just recently we we did some work on uh, Lake Wingro for the log rolling competition. So, <clears throat> and again, uh, our program or the mechanical harvesting is regulated by by the DNR. So, how do we get how do we how do we put these plans together and what are some of the steps? And I think it's important to understand that it's not as easy as every five years just. Uh, putting a, a couple page plan together. There's a lot that goes into it. Uh, there's a lot of science, there's a lot of analysis. And the first one is the point intercept. So we get grids from the DNR um, of points spread out on the entire Yahara chain of lakes. And um, those grids compromise roughly five to 6,000 sampling points that we're required to go out and take a look at. Not all of them have plants to sample. Some of them may be in deeper water, but either way, um, it's a, it's a tedious process. So that's the first step is actually determine what your plant community is. And this is the point intercept program. Uh, there's a picture of myself and my LTE out. Uh, it's nothing more than lining yourself up on these uh, predetermined sampling points, sticking a rake down to the bottom, twisting it three times, pulling it up and I, identifying what plants you have and, and giving it a, um, uh, a mass rating or a density rating. So done July through August, makes sense, right? That's when our plants are at their greatest densities. And then we can go ahead and plug that data into uh, a number of different spreadsheets and give us an analysis of what our plant communities look like. So some of the information that we gather, uh, depth of maximum rooted growth. So that would be that photic zone I talked about earlier which would be that 15 to 16 foot species list in comparisons, frequency, uh, how much vegetation per site, summarization stats, um, and it goes on and on and on. So um, we don't necessarily use that information to a great detail. I like to look at trend data and see how the plant community changes because I do have an interest in the invasive aspect, um, but DNR does, does log this information and uses it in their long-term analysis of lakes. Once we put this information together, gather this, we're required to have a, um, a public comment period. Uh, our plans also require us to look at water quality, fisheries, um, it has an invasive component, critical habitat, and IPM, which is integrated pest management. I include that on here. What are the ways we can have the least amount of input on the ecosystem um, 
whether it be spot spraying, uh, mechanical, so on and so forth. And I'll talk a little bit more about what critical habitat is in a minute. Um, the public comment period will be your opportunity. Our plans are up uh, after this year. Uh, we've been working with DNR where we're gonna start um, staging those rather than doing five lakes at the same time, uh, which can be very daunting. We're gonna go ahead and uh, probably do two lakes uh, in 2023 and then um, alternate the other lakes after that. So give us a little breathing room. And um, But public comment period is your opportunity, general public to come out and provide comments on, on um, what you feel is a need or what we're, what we're doing good is nice too. So I just wanted to touch on one of the, <clears throat> one of the metrics or one of the definitions here um, of the plan. I, I mentioned critical habitat earlier, and again, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute, but um, the floristic quality index, the FQI. So uh, oftentimes people ask me, well, Pete, how do, how do the, the Yahara chain of lakes compare from, with their plant community to others? So um, there is a, um, an average, uh, a statewide average of, of 24, um, and then um, there's an ecoregion average of 20. So ecoregion means uh, for, for lack of, uh, um, well, let's just say that eco region would be the south central portion of Wisconsin. So some of these other lakes around here, Nelvin, Koshkanon, maybe some others like that. Um, how do we compare to those with respect to our plant community? So the picture you're seeing here, that's Lake Mendota. So those are the number of aquatic plant species that we had in Lake Mendota. We had 18 different species in, in 20, um, 2017 with FQI at 21.5. So Mendota was a little bit more ro robust than some of the other lakes um, with the species diversity. And then uh, back in 17, Kiganza was down at 13 and Monona, Wabisa at 18. And you'll notice Wingra at 24.78. So Wingra for, for a lake in this eco region actually was pretty outstanding. So um, a lot of that has to do with um, the common carp removal. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So that'll give you some sense. I would bet right now with what we're seeing on Lake Higanza, those of you who are from that area or live on that lake, that number is gonna rise substantially. So we're seeing quite a bit of plant growth um, on Lake Higanza this year for a couple different reasons. So um, I do wear another hat, invasive species, and the plants do fall into that category. Uh, as you can see here, um, my pointer's not showing up, but the far left, uh, that would be curly leaf pondweed. That's a fast, early growing plant, typically starts uh, under the ice and uh, very aggressive, shoots up right away, can actually out, out compete other native uh, plants. And it starts to die this time of year. So it's nests back, um, has these small little fruiting bodies called turions on them that settle down into the sediment and uh, the whole process is started over again. And of course, we're all familiar with uh, the center one there, uh, Eurasian water milfoil. It's been around for oh, probably since the early 60s. Um, we see that kind of ebb and flow with, with, the, uh, with the amount of density. Right now, I'm not seeing as much milfoil as I have in the past. Um, don't know why that is. I'm seeing a lot more coontail, which is a native. And then I've included a picture here, um, that plant on the far right, that is water lettuce. So that was actually um, found back oh, probably 10 years ago, lot 60 over in University Bay. Um, uh, a student in the botany department actually recognized it and brought it to our attention. So we had a rapid response that went out and we actually hand pulled it and were able to eradicate that. So there's a few other plants I've dealt with, purple floating heart on a small, um, farm pond, and then uh, I've seen parrot feather uh, out on, a, on another uh, water garden. Um, water lettuce is, is really prevalent in the uh, pet trade and aquarium. So those are all species that, that certainly threaten our lakes from a plant standpoint. And I won't spend any time on, on some of the other critters that you see here. But if you look at why, you know, why we're ripe for invasives, including plants, it's it's our location within the state. So um, we've got two major uh, highways that bisect the county. We have a very popular 
uh, chain of lakes. Uh, Mendota is the fifth highest used lake from a recreation standpoint in Wisconsin. We've got super spreaders to our west in the Mississippi River, to our north in Lake Wisconsin and the Wisconsin River, to our east in Lake Michigan, and to our south and southeast. Uh, so we're kind of in a really good location. And when we, uh, when we took a look at the data a couple of years ago, we do clean boats, clean water. So that's where we, we interact with um, the boating community. And 40% um, of the boaters coming in um, had spent time on some infested water body, um, at least earlier before their trip to, to, uh, to this one. So very critical. Um, and I know Clean Lakes has, has staff out this year, as do we, to keep informing our general public on the importance of, of keeping invasives out of our system. So with respect to some of the native plants, again, I'm not gonna, I just wanted to throw some pictures up here. Um, you know, these are, these are plants we'll see uh, on occasion, um, these were plants that were found in our uh, in our study early on. So we do have a nice mix of native plants in uh, in the Ahara chain, and the majority of the plants that are harvested include milfoil. Um, the center one would be valsinaria or water celery. So you'll see that one starting to really take off this time of year as it gets ready to send up its flowers. Um, and the plant becomes very, um, it's a weak plant, so it's somewhat brittle. So it's like through August, um, if you, it'd be like taking your grass clippings and dumping them in the water. It just kind of spreads out. I think a lot of you know what I'm talking about that are on the system. Um, it's a great plant. It's important for, uh, for fisheries, and it's uh, got a really rich tuber for waterfowl um, that migrate through in the fall. Uh, so it's one of those that, um, while it's native, it can sometimes be problematic. The far right, that's coontail, that's a native plant. And then certainly, last but not least, is what we're seeing quite a bit of this year on Lake Ugansk, and that's sago pondweed. So um, sago pondweed is really a, a preferred plant for um, common carp. Common carp love sago pondweed. And there's been a... Um, a pretty intense effort of carp removal down on Kiganza. And, you know, one of my theories is maybe, maybe we're seeing kind of the, the fruits of that labor, if you will, um, the aggressive carp removals is that we're, we're getting clear water and more plant growth. So uh, we'll talk about that in a minute as well. I oftentimes get questioned every spring, um, right around the middle of May to the second of June, second week of June, Pete, why do you have your harvesters out, the bluegills and the bass are spawning? You're gonna ruin the fishery, um, blah, 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 blah. So uh, during our last plant write-up in, in 20, uh, plan write-up in 2017, worked exclusively with Dan Oley and Dave Rowe at DNR, the fisheries managers for the area. And we kind of took a look at, um, we kind of took a look at what, what the data showed us. Was there any potential that our harvesters were having um, any impact on that. So we know that the, uh, the plant community is vital for the fishery. We're out there cutting it, but um, were we having necessarily any impact on it? So I don't want you to pay any attention. I'm not gonna get into this in detail to, um, now this is, this is data through 2018, but uh, smallmouth and, and walleye obviously aren't, aren't vegetation spawners, but if you look at largemouth bass and and bluegill, certainly those are, they spawn in areas where, where vegetation densities are greatest. So the red line actually represents what would be like young of the year or first year, year fish. And you can see, um, you know, there's a lot of noise in those graphs on the left-hand side. Um, and the indication to us when we analyze that is, you know, there's really th those specific years, previous years from about 2012 on, those are some pretty good recruitment years. Uh, in fact, really outstanding years. So uh, that kind of told us, uh, um, you know, at least from our standpoint, we need to feel now, obviously you have to factor in weather and water levels and temperature and a whole host of other things. But uh, the fact remains that those were really good spawning years and highly unlikely um, that our, our harvesting program has any impact on the fishery. If we do pull a fish up on the, on the screen or the, um, the front of the, the machine, our staff are, are usually pretty quick to shut the machine down 
jump off and um, return that fish to the water. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're seeing with the impacts or potentially the impacts from carp. So we've had some aggressive removals in Lake Wingra, Cherokee, and Kiganza going back to, oh, probably 2006 when we started planning that. Um, hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, removed from those water bodies. Um, what was interesting, I don't know if anybody remembers the, the uh, 2017, we had a solar eclipse um, in August, I think it was. And I was actually on Kiganza that day doing a plant survey. And, you know, the bird, I was kind of keeping an eye on it. It was rather um, interesting to be out there as it was getting dark at two in the afternoon or whatever it was. But um, the birds were chirping, oddly enough, and everybody was kind of quiet on the lake. And um, all of a sudden, I see these carp porpoising. And I'm thinking, oh, the world's coming to an end, right? I got fish jumping, the birds singing, blah, 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 blah. Um, there was a koi virus was kicking in if you remember that. So we lost a lot of carp to the koi virus back in 2017, which probably even aided the efforts of, of the carp removals prior to that um, even more. So there's no way to calculate how many hundreds of pounds or thousands of pounds or whatever of fish die, but um, from Monona all the way down through the river and in the Kiganza, we had, we had a lot of dead carp going on. In fact, I know because they were calling John and I asking us if we could remove them with the harvesters. So. Um, so <clears throat> common carp is kind of a key driver in, in lake management. And when you remove carp, your first response is going to be clear water and clear water equals more plants. Okay. Very well studied. We're doing it on other small water bodies around the system. Just wanted to throw this up there quick. Everybody remembers Lake Wingra, the exclosure. You can see here that exclosure had no carp in it for a number of years and uh, the water cleared up and then outside the lake, we still remained in a, a turbid algal state because of their benthic feeding behavior. So something to keep in mind as we move forward um, and maybe look at carp management as a tool to improve our aquatic plant communities and overall water quality. So let's get a little bit into our, I, I said earlier that I, I jump around a little bit. I'm trying to give you as much information as I can here. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about our staff and our operations. So <clears throat> interestingly enough, I was at a, a, a presentation about a month and a half ago on aquatic plant management, in particular mechanical harvesting. And I heard something very interesting that I did not know, and I, and I know John Reimer didn't know, uh, is that we have the largest fleet in the United States. So um, the other big program of all places is Lake Chautauqua in New York. So um, I did a little research and kind of looked at, and it, ironically for, for two entities or agencies that have never communicated, our programs are really, really similar. So um, it's the largest one that I know of. About tw um, 20,000 permits are, are given in Wisconsin every year for some type of aquatic plant control, 20% of those our mechanical harvesting. So um, most mechanical harvesting operations have one to two machines. Um, you can see here, uh, we're a lot bigger. So our staff has five FTEs, including myself and John Reimer. Um, we also have two full-time mechanics and a lake operations supervisor. We do hire 24 LTEs. Um, we have 12 harvesters. We're actually working on our 13th right now. Um, our staff are pretty talented. so. Um, we buy the, the barge and then they will go ahead and construct it from there. Three barges, one transport barge. You see the transport barge, um, that's the green uh, in the photo there. Um, that transport barge is able to hold three loads of what the typical harvester will hold. So in an ideal situation, we can pull up behind the harvester on a water body, offload um, three different times before that um, uh, transport barge has to go back and offload to the elevator. So it's an extreme time saver. Um, we've analyzed it. We'll, we'll get about 50% more work done on a large water body, uh, let's say Mendota, than we would if we, otherwise we have to keep driving back and forth to the, um, to the offload site. So um, we're also getting a new FTE later this summer. And then uh, our budget line for our LTEs was increased by 50,000 this year too, which gave us a little bit more flexibility. 
So we also have the barge pickup program. I know many of you are familiar with that. Uh, the city of Madison, Monona, Westport folks and the Lake Wabisa Conservation Association actually cover um, the cost of that. Uh, we do not make money on that. It just basically covers the cost of our staff and our fuel. So um, the caveat, we will go around, we have a schedule. Um, we'll pick up material um, from your dock, um, lake generated material. So any aquatic debris that is generated in the lake, we will pick up off your dock. I do get quite a few calls um, from the shorelines of Middleton, Shorewood, and uh, Maple Bluff. How come, uh, why, why did your barge operator drive past my dock? And uh, the reality is that um, in working with those municipalities, they have not expressed a desire for us to, to work with them yet from that standpoint. So their answer is we have our residents move the material they collect from the lake um, out to the curb and it's picked up through whatever uh, municipal uh, recycling program they have. So um, I put the map of Mendota here to show you all those areas. So the areas in gray are not covered. Everything else uh, is picked up. So oftentimes people want to know where the material goes. We have approved sites through our planning process. Um, we have county owned property, both Hurling and the Yonkin Road site. Uh, kind of splits the difference between the two water or the, the water bodies that we do harvest on. Um, occasionally, I'll get calls from folks that say, hey, Pete, um, I could really use a, a load of those lake weeds in my garden. And uh, depending on the time of year and how busy we are and um, where we are, uh, we'll, we'll try to make that happen. So um, rumor has it that um, the Hera Lake vegetation grows the biggest tomatoes in the state of Wisconsin. I, I don't know that, but that's, that's what I've been told by multiple um, at-home gardeners. So um, it does make great compost and obviously it's, a, it's an excellent amendment to the soil. So <clears throat> end of the year comes, we sit down, we analyze the data. Um, what we have here is uh, what our report looks like to DNR. We're required to give this to DNR every year. It's also a good tool for us as far as tracking. Um, so you can see 2020 and 2021, um, you know, we look at hours and my big thing is I look at hours and loads. Um, that's what I, what I focus on. I think John does too. Certainly there's a, a phosphorus reduction with the amount of material that you're removing. Um, you know, everything we do now we have, we, we try to get a credit for. Um, so, um, you know, it's significant too. We're removing the material that can be recycled from a nutrient standpoint. So um, those are your numbers and where the efforts are. Um, water bodies do vary a little bit. You'll see, like I had Indian Lake in 2021, I'm doing a car project out there. All of that plant material was, was actually curly leaf pond weed that was taken in early May. Same thing with the river. We do cut, cut quite frequently in the river, both um, below Babcock and below La Follette. The last two years, we have not cut much um, below Babcock because of the dredging operations. Um, and we had low water last year, so that was tough. But um, this year, we've, we've been going gangbusters since probably the first part of June, uh, end of May, um, below La Fala Dam. So we had a major, major blockage in that area. Um, we couldn't get water through the system. And again, meeting priorities of our plan and keeping water moving through the system that was the reason why um, we were there. The good news for everybody um, is that those machines were pulling out. All four lakes will have harvesters on them, uh, probably by the middle, beginning the middle of next week. Um, and we intend to service at least a minimum of one, one more time, all the water bodies. So if you're thinking about calling us, just be patient, we'll be there very, very soon. So this is what the, what the uh, cutting map looks like or the priority plan map. Um, blue represents areas that we cut. Yellow are, are areas that, that we can cut or we potentially might cut. The red is, is pretty much either um, a hazard area or an area that um, uh, is undeveloped. So again, critical habitat is, is, we classify that as anything that's undeveloped. So we do not go in there and disturb any of the plant community or, or the, uh, the fish community, invertebrates, whatever. We kind of off limits and, and 
and, and stay out of that. So uh, this, this is Monona here. Um, these maps have been the same for many, many years. There's been some slight variations. Um, the variation on this one would be the spoke pattern in Monona Bay. So the idea to allow a little bit better water skiing, if you will. So that was a suggestion that came during the public comment period. Uh, Lake Higanza, here's another example. Again, um, if you look at the, uh, the upper portion of this map here, um, by the 2100, that's all undeveloped shoreline, typically a massive, massive um, Valsenaria bed, and this year, uh, Sago Pondweed, um, and the people along that shoreline there um, often call us and say, hey, what can you do? So we can't cut that area. That, uh, that is off limits to us. Um, so we can do some pickup after the fact, but we do not move our machines into those areas. So the map is not quite to scale for, for you know, what we're looking at here. Um, the idea is behind it is, is to show you where we're allowed to cut. But if you really would want to get down into the details, um, this map here is the scale. So this is uh, just a small shoreline here over on Lake Mendota. So what we do is we cut anywhere from three to six cutter widths. So our cutter widths are, are 10 feet our screens and our, our sickle bar. So um, when you think about it and you think of the amount of, of acreage, we really don't cut a heck of a lot of plant material or area. Um, so on this one here, you can see the yellow box just to give you an indication is, is where, where we cut and how that would work. It's typically the end of the dock and we just kind of follow that along. And then um, maybe every fourth or fifth dock or sixth or depending on the area, will cut a perpendicular access lane. So the idea would be to get your boat in and then travel to your specific dock. So um, sometimes those access lanes aren't needed. Sometimes they go out quite a ways. It just depends on the season. So um, that's how our plans are set up. So when we get phone calls and people are asking for us to go out a little bit farther, we're really limited on what, what we're allowed to do. Um, and I wanna reiterate, uh, a couple of things that, that is actually in the permit from Wisconsin DNR to us. So um, when they approve it, this is language they have in there. So we're not supposed to cut in areas of three feet or water or less. Um, and that's kind of been a little contentious over the last few years with rising and lowering water levels. Um, we just keep it standard, end of the dock. Um, is, is where we, we target. And I'll be honest, some of that water is a little bit less than three feet, some's more, um, but on average, we're, we're pretty good. Um, only downward water depths exceed three feet of water. So scooping of floating plants by creating currents, back flushing with, with the paddle wheels to move that material out um, is prohibited due to scouring and resuspension. So we actually, to be honest with you, got called out on it a couple of years ago. And it can be a pretty effective method, especially for those of you that see uh, filamentous algae blowing in. Um, maybe it's harboring, a few, there's a few dead fish in there. We got a blue green bloom just kind of localized there. It's kind of nice to get that out of there. We'll pick it up. Um, there were a few people that called us and DNR considered it dredging without a permit. So they were really watching us close on that. Um, the good thing is, I think when we recognize that it is a potential water quality issue, um, we have a really good relationship with them. I'll kind of help make that decision, say, look, in the betterment of, of, of cleaning this up, we're going to go ahead and follow through with this. I think it's more advantageous to do it than not. And we haven't had any issues since that time. So it's just a matter of communicating. Um, I mentioned the areas with uh, obstructions or hazards and ecologically significant. And then again, um, you know, um, John and I will get involved and we'll make a phone call and we'll consult with the fisheries and the water quality biologists. And I think um, for the most part, as long as we're communicating, uh, um, everything is, is, is pretty good. So just to reiterate um, some of the limitations of the program, um, I'm finding that more of my job is managing public expectations now. Um, what we can and can't do, why we can't do it, why we can do it. Um, so that's what I'm hopeful uh, we'll see today. I think overall this year we're, we're pretty good. You know, 
Um, we've had a few phone calls, like I said, 90 to 95% of the inquiries that we've received have been on Lake Eganza, and I'm gonna highlight that here in a second. But uh, overall, um, water clarity is pretty decent. Um, I haven't seen as many blue-green blooms as I have in the past. Um, I've had some, I've taken some secchi depth readings here the last few weeks and 16, 18 feet on certain days, which is fantastic in my opinion. So, um, but the program's limitations, um, when I say staff, every year we have an influx of new employees and those new employees, it's a challenge to drive one of those machines. So um, if you can imagine getting on a big machine as a, as a college student, um, maybe not a lot of experience, um, you know, takes them a month to really get their feet underneath them. And the wind can be really tough on that. So um, that's another reason why we don't go in between docks either. Um, there's liability. We've, we've paid out a fair amount of money over the years for damaged watercraft that isn't our own. So not to mention pulling legs of piers out and things like that. It, it, it can be tricky and we have some really good senior staff that are excellent at it. And we work with them more uh, maybe than we would with our, with our new staff. Uh, we do have equipment issues from time to time. So um, these are big machines with a lot of moving parts. Um, we had a fire on one this year. Um, we were able to get it out right away and machine was fixed within hours. Um, fuel issues, fuel pump, um, all the, um, uh, hydraulic pumps that are, are running these machines and sickle bars that maybe get bent on a rock. So we have two, two trucks that are constantly out servicing and fueling. And um, so it can become an issue with equipment, changing water depths, um, not so much of an issue this year. Last year was a little bit more. Um, most of the obstructions, we, we certainly know where they're at. And just a reminder that um, if it's critical habitat on the map, don't expect us to go in there and cut it because I'm not going to I'm not going to have it done. So um, that's, you know, that's pretty much uh, a no go on those issues. So <clears throat> as I get ready to close here and open it up for questions, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why we see yearly variations in plants. And I, I really don't know why I can't answer that. Um, I have my own theories, but um, I, I wanted to throw up this, um, this sonar map of Lake Higanza from 2017 through 2021. So um, what the map is showing, the lake is divided in two here, is we transect the lake with our sonar and we actually record um, the pings that are coming back and we can generate basically what it is is a heat map or in Max's case looks like a severe thunderstorm warning on certain parts of the lake. Um, but the darker the red, the more dense the plants are. Um, and you can see some, some definite yearly variation. And if you look at last year, I think it'd be safe to say that, you know, that's a good indication of probably what we were going to see the following year. So my question is, and my, with, with DNR and our staff and, and others is, are we now seeing the results of this massive carp removal effort that took place? Are we seeing results of less available pea to feed the algae and the plants are doing better? Um, is it a function of conservation? Is it a function of weather? Is it climate change? Um, low precipitation years, you know, 27, 18 and 19 were pretty high, 20 and 21, we were down about 10 inches. Um, so there's a number of variations between water temperature, when does the ice come off, uh, those runoff events, um, the clarity of the water. We know the clarity of water on Kigans is fantastic this year. Um, clear water means more plants. Doesn't matter what water body you're on, you're going to see it. Uh, and then I threw the rough fish removal in there. And I guess the wild card in all of this would be, are zebra mussels having any impact? Are they taking nutrients out of the water, clearing the water, and then allowing the plants to thrive more. So um, perhaps uh, um, some, some more research uh, needs to be done on that front. But um, in general, um, I think the county does the best we can given the limitations of our plan and our staff. And um, we certainly welcome questions that come in and we, we try to be forthright with our answers to, to people. And 
the big takeaway this morning would be that um, managing aquatic plants is, uh, it, it's more than just going out on the harvester. So there's a lot of variables that factor into it. And um, try to remember that a, a thriving plant community is, is a sign of a healthy lake. So um, if, if you had no plants out there, I'd be a lot more concerned than um, if you have more. Um, of course, you can find this information on, um, on our website there on the bottom. And um, I'll be sending a, a link to a YouTube video. I'm sorry, I don't have it right now where I kind of get into detail when I'm on the water, if, if there's interest in that. That's about a 12 minute video. I'll, I'll send that to, to Luke. So um, our plans are on there, our priority areas, our harvester locations and our barge collection schedule. So those of you on the water bodies that want to know when we're going to be out picking material up, um, you'll find that on there. So with that, um, I'm certainly happy to take questions here for a few minutes. We do not. Uh, the question was whether or not we tested the plants for uh, PFAS. That is, is not something we're doing right now, no. We have tested them for nutrient content for their phosphorus concentration, but nothing else. Sure, so whether it's their, um, the root mass is holding the sediment in place, just like you would on, on an upland site. Um, and they can also help dissipate wave action too. So the energy of the waves coming in may be dissipated by the plants, depending on the, the species of the plant. Some are a little bit more uh, stout, if you will, than others, but um, there's definite value in that. Uh, I think there's a lot, are you talking about the, the phosphorus, the in-lake phosphorus, the loading? Um, there's a number of different monitoring activities that are going on. Uh, there's some surface water monitoring samples that are taken. There's some volunteer sampling that's going on on the system. Um, John, I don't know, maybe you want to add to that a little bit about, about the phosphorus, but um, we have, you have gauging stations out there with the USGS and other partnerships. So we have a way of tracking on an annual basis, plus what what we calculate based on the plant materials. So there are multiple ways of looking at it. Um, you know, I think it just has to be, te the data has to be teased out a little bit more. There, yeah, we look at the historical data set. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if we're seeing um, more now. I, it usually happens early when the water temps are cool. You'll see that that's kind of the first thing that starts to aggregate. And as water temperatures warm and the plant dies, it'll, it'll tend to, to gas off and, and, and rise up to the surface. And then we get these big balls or, or globs. Um, I think every year is a little different. I think a lot of my personal opinion is I think a lot of it has to do is with with water temps and when the ice goes off. So um, water temps were cold right through about mid May, which was favorable growing conditions.
Yeah, that's an excellent question. So um, there, at least for, for AIS control of, of plants, um, hand pulling, um, mini suction is, is pretty effective. On our, on our situation here, obviously not so much. There was a few years back, um, they actually did a 2,4-D treatment on Monona that was pretty good. And then we saw the plant kind of recolonize. You're exactly right. Milfoil does, um, can, can grow from fragmentation. Um, we are probably contributing, to be honest with you, some plant growth on that front. Um, however, I think in the long term, if you look at the effectiveness of our, of our harvester, yeah, our cutting head is 10 feet, but we've got three feet of paddles out here. We're going to be pulling and ripping some of that material that's going to escape. So um, we've looked at it extensively over the years. We figure that our harvesting is about 80% effective. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, 80% effective on what we cut we're getting. And then um, we're putting more of an emphasis on um, picking up the floater. So um, ideally, I like to have... You remember the Mighty Ducks movie with the kids in the hockey, they had the fighting bee or whatever that was called. I kind of like our machines to run like that, one offset behind the other where they can try to pick up and minimize any additional fragmentation, sprouting regrowth of the, of, of the plants. So, Adam has it. This is going to get feedback. Maybe I turned up the levels too much. We have a lot of questions online, actually, Max. I'm going to get to a couple of them here. One uh, person has two questions. Uh, are there, is there any harvesting on the tributary streams in the lake system? And the follow-up to that is besides some home composters, are any lake weeds going to biodigesters for energy production? So there are no harvesting going on other than um, the Ahara River system itself, the main stem. So we don't harvest on any of the other um, streams. Now there is some, obviously there's some benefit with some of the suck the muck work that John's been working on. On some of these smaller segments. Um, no, our material does not, we're not sending it over to the, to the digester. Um, there is some discussion of looking at that further, but as it stands right now, that material is composted on those two county owned properties that we have. Check, check, check. Okay, we've got something here. I got a couple more here. Um, Somebody asked a good question. They said, you know, we've circled back to um, given the limitations, right? You said a lot of things. Well, given the limitations we have, would you ask for the limit, if the limitations were not in place, how would you change what you do and how much would you do? I mean, could it, would it change what you do? I, I personally don't think it would, um, considering that, um, you know, we're dealing with up to five different water bodies, sometimes more plus a major river system. Um, we're stretched in the way it is with our equipment. Ideally, we target um, a service twice a year. So we want to get around those lakes twice a year. Um, typically, you know, June to early July, and then again, sometime in mid to late August to provide that relief. If we were to cut any more than what we were cutting based on the scale, I don't, I don't think you, number one, I don't think we could do it. Number two, I'm not sure what, how much of a difference it would make when it, when you factor in what the goals of the, uh, of the plan are one to keep water moving and two, recreational access. All right. Another in-person question. Uh, what's the total amount of material you collect annually? Ah, uh, let's look back here. Whoops. Um, I don't have the figure off the top of my head, but we can see, there it is right there. So uh, total, uh, total loads in 2021 was about 2,687 with 12,360 tons um, of material. So pretty significant amount of, of material collected. Um, here's an interesting one. Um, someone wanted to know, does the amount of snow cover have any significant effect? I think it can, um, certainly, uh, especially as you get later in the season, once the sunlight can penetrate the ice, um, Things, things will start growing. And then someone kind of had, this is a very interesting question. Of the species that you typically harvest the largest volume of, do you tend to get the roots too, or does the plant just break off when you harvest yeah, it? Yeah, no, we don't get the roots. Our, our cutter machine has a sickle on it. So it, as it moves forward, it's actually cutting the plant, um, depending on how far down. Um, 
I usually direct our staff once the once the plant is within a foot and a half of the surface, I consider that ready to be harvested. Okay, so I don't necessarily want to see the plants topped out on the water body. That might be too late. So if we can get out there and and, and get them cut, um, we do not cut them off at the roots. No. From our friend Mark from the DNR um, said. We raise the water levels of the lakes with dams, flooding the adjacent fertile soils. The rich soils in our underwater feeding all the plants and the original sandy bottom and beaches under nine feet of water on Mendota specifically. Do we have an idea of just how much these submerged soils have increased the near shore eutroph eutrophication and growth of plants compared to the original sandy bottom shoreline? Mark is with the DNR, so he has a very good question. Yeah, um, I can't answer that specifically to to the Yahara chain or Mendota specifically. But what I can tell you is on other water bodies that I work where we have had flooded farm fields within the recent years, I'm seeing a massive influx of aquatic plants in these shallow water areas that were previously as little as five years ago far. So they're highly likely that there's a reason. After this amount of time, I wouldn't know how to really give you a good answer on that one. All right, any other questions? Yeah, we can have time for about one, maybe two more, and then we'll wrap it up. Pete, I imagine every, every lake and every area on a lake is gonna be different based on what you're collecting from the, the harvesters because the plant community changes you know, in, in, by area. Um, but what would you estimate in a typical load that you're harvesting, what percentage is like these, this invasive Eurasian water milfoil compared to other species? So um, when we're harvesting in, in June, uh, I would say maybe like 10% curly leaf, maybe another 10 to 30 or 40% of um, milfoil. And there's a lot of coontail in there. Um, now, I'm kind of going on what I'm seeing this year, along with, um, I just started seeing the Valsanaria show up, um, but again, the Sago Pondweed, which is a native, there's, there's a lot of that on Mendota this year too, uh, as well as Kikanza. So um, what I've also found is the farther out you go, the deeper you go, probably out of our cutting zones, I'm seeing a lot more milfoil in those deeper water areas now than I have before as well. But as the summer progresses here, I'd expect our Valsanaria to be a majority of what we're seeing. Someone wanted to know if they heard correctly that you don't harvest water lilies um, because they were mentioning that they can cover a fair amount of the surface on the upper Yahara. That is true. Um, we do. I can't remember a time in my career where we've ever really harvested any any floating leaf plants, whether it be lotus, um, white water lily, yellow water lily. We try to avoid those. Um, We've taken some flack if we've gotten too close to certain beds. Um, some of our maybe more inexperienced operators, but it's not a standard practice practice of ours. And I'm really not in any of the areas, with the exception of um, I'm thinking of our approved plans. Maybe on Monona Bay um, and a few small sections of the river. But when we harvest the river, we harvest the Thalweg or the center of the channel. So doesn't seem to be a conflict anywhere for for what I'm familiar with. All right, one more time for Pete Jopke. Thanks so much for coming in and Thank talking you. with us today at the 101 Science Cafe. I appreciate it. Well, coming up next, you're going to want to mark your calendars Monday, August 22nd. So not on a Wednesday. Monday, the 22nd next month is when we're having a little bit of a different 101 Science Cafe. And that's because we will be at the latest site of Dane County's Suck the Muck program. We're going to be out at Six Mile Creek on the north side of Lake Mendota. So again, not meeting at the Edgewater. We're going to be over at Six Mile Creek on Lake Mendota's north side. And special guest, Dane County Executive Joe Parisi will be there presenting updated information. And we get to take part of a walking tour of that site too. So little bit of a different scene. If you had additional questions we weren't able to get to, you can always email them to info at cleanlakesalliance.org. Uh, be on the lookout as well for that 12-minute video that uh, 
Pete was going to pass along to see the process, a uh, little bit of a virtual tour. That would be kind of neat as well. Uh, and of course, any, all, any and all information at cleanlakesalliance.org. Again, I'm Max Saparis, meteorologist at WKOW, proud sponsor with Clean Lakes Alliance. Apologize for my tardiness today, but again, thanks for getting everything started and another great talk this month. So we will see you next month, Monday, August 22nd at Six Mile Creek on, Madith on uh, Lake Mendota's North Shore. Till then, talk to you later. Oh, the timing. Oh, it's later. Well, that's an important thing to point out too. 4 to 6 p.m., August 22nd. I see you folks with your phones out, marking it down. Good idea. And again, Lake Mendota North Shore for that presentation. All right, we'll talk to you then. Thanks so much for coming in.